Thank you so much for having me, everybody. Uh, my name is David Oaken. I'm a developer evangelist for IBM, uh, also known as Strong Loop. And by that, I don't mean IBM has had this secret name all this time. Uh, Strong Loop is a company, as I said earlier this morning, that was acquired by IBM. And I work with that company as far as working on API tooling. But I also work with the Swift team, and I'm going to be talking to y'all a little bit about what's happening in Kitura. So a show of hands here, because we'll be talking about server-side Swift. Uh, who here didn't know that you could write Swift on the server? Didn't know that we could write Swift on the server. Ah, OK, correct. OK, so if, and, and, and we're not trying to single anybody out, but we're hoping that by the end of this talk, or at least by the end of this slide, that you knew that you could write. So I guess I'll just dive right in, and I'll say that uh, what we'll be doing today is a little bit of what's the state of things ever since uh, you've been able to write Swift on the server. So we'll do a server-side Swift state of the union, which is a mouthful, so I'll just go ahead and say that for you. And then we'll be talking a little bit about what is Kitura. Uh, how has it grown? How has it matured? Uh, some of you might be wondering, what is Kitura? And we'll be talking a little bit about that. Uh, and then I'll talk about a couple of demos that I'll be doing, which will show you how Kitura has grown. So we'll be talking about a framework called uh, Query. We'll be talking about WebSockets, now you can use those and a super secret mystery demo that I had the name in there until about five minutes ago, but I thought I'd share that until the very end, and then we'll finish it off. So I'm actually going to introduce myself with the slide uh, because I really want the impact of what server-side Swift and how it uh, made me feel. I would like for you to feel the same sort of impact as well to understand why, at least for me, this is a big deal. So that's me trying to get Katara working on an Amiga Commodore. And what we happened, uh, just to give you an idea, I joined IBM in November of 2016, uh, having learned about this framework called Kitura in February of 2016, uh, which was open source to them. Uh, previously, I used to be the mobile lead at ID Scan Biometrics, which is a biometrics company in London. And my first exposure to any kind of server-related software, any kind of backend, was with Parse. And who here, if you can raise your hands, has worked with Parse before? And keep your hand up if it was the first time you ever used any kind of backend. Great. OK, a couple of us. And this is, I, I always remember this, and one day I'll get around to this. I had a backend that was up on Parse uh, when it went out of commission. I should probably get around to fixing that at some point. Uh, but the reason I mentioned Parse is because uh, I didn't, you know, I didn't study computer science in university. I studied physics. And so I was kind of a bit of a late bloomer when it came to software development. And what that meant for me is when I learned Objective-C and I got really used to it, I didn't really give myself the attention that I needed in order to learn how to actually do a backend. And so I felt pigeonholed by Objective-C development. So when a solution like Parse came out, I jumped to it because it made it easy for me. It made it something that I could just get up and running and not have to worry about it and let it do the heavy lifting for me. Now, as you work with RESTful APIs and as I started to kind of play around with my instance of Parse, I started to realize, oh, JavaScript's not that's scary, and past that, if you want to roll up your own API, there's tons of options out there. Uh, you've got, you know, you can write an API in Node, and it's perfectly fine to do that. You can, you can choose to write an, uh, a REST API in PHP if you want. Uh, you can try doing one in Java. I, sorry, I can't finish that sentence. It's fun if you want to try that. Go right ahead. I, I, don't, I don't mean to marginalize anybody, actually. Uh, I know plenty of very nice Java developers. Uh, but at the same time, this really proved a point because before June of 2014, uh, I can at least speak for myself, and I'm sure I'm speaking for somebody else in the room here, that we were pigeonholed with Objective-C, and nobody wanted to even think about writing a RESTful API in Objective-C. You know, block syntax doesn't belong on a server, uh, square brackets don't belong on a server, and, and I don't know about you, but I didn't want it to expand to that. Uh, so in 2014, they announced Swift, and I thought, great, another language that we all have to learn because that is what our overlords are pushing on us. And we'll go ahead and jump into that. But then a funny thing happened in 2015. Swift was open sourced. And when I talked to a couple of my, like, for instance, when I talked to my previous boss at my company that I worked for in London, uh, he told me, well, of course they were going to open Swift. They had to. You can't be a prominent uh, programming language these days and not open source your source. He is objectively correct, I think. But at the same time, it was still heartwarming to see Apple do something like this. Um, what they fit in as kind of a side note when they open source Swift, they were talking about how it's open. You know, Craig Federighi does this thing and he gets all this thunder applause. And by the way, it compiles on Linux as well. Anyway, so next topic of discussion. And nobody seemed to notice that. But there was one company in particular that noticed, among 
many, many others, and that was IBM. And like I said, we weren't the only ones that noticed that suddenly you could get Swift to compile on Linux. And it's important to point out that, yes, the logo of the framework we'll be talking about today is front and center, but it's surrounded by choice. And as a developer evangelist, I'm a very firm believer in the power of choice. And that power of choice does two things. One, it gives you, the developer, an opportunity to pick what's going to be best for whatever it is you're working on. But additionally, when we're working on a product like Kitora, the advancements of Perfect, of Vapor, of Tris, of Zui, all of these make our product better because that competition is going to make you say, okay, well, how can we get alongside that? So that means that Kitora has matured by leaps and bounds just because of how popular Vapor has been or how popular Perfect has been. And I encourage you not just to try Kitora, try Vapor, try Perfect. They're great frameworks. They work really, really well. Kitura also does, and we'll be talking about that. And I've said Kitura enough times to the point where you're probably squirming in your seat and saying, what is Kitura? So I'll dive right into that. Kitura is a RESTful API framework that is written in Swift. It is modeled after Express, which, uh, show of hands, who else was, uh, has written Node before? Okay. Uh, it's modeled after Express, which is safe to say one of the most popular modules on the Node Package Manager. And Kitura is modeled, it's used uh, libcurl. So we think we've got a pretty good offering, and what we think separates us is we're focused on long-term support with Apple. Now, what this means for you is when it comes to server-side Swift, we want to make sure that the Swift you write on the server is the same Swift that you've spent all this time trying to learn how to write on your iPhone. What I mean by that is Libraries like Foundation, libraries like Dispatch, you know, you should be able to use URL session the way that you would anywhere else. So when it comes to Linux stability, we're focused on making sure that all of these libraries and all of these APIs that you know and love compile the same way that they do, for an instance, on the server as they would on your phone. And a little bit of stats about this. So uh, just because Kitora was open sourced in 2016, uh, they've been working on it ever since it was uh, announced to be open source in June of 2015. And we've had really good relationships with the people on the Swift mailing list, all the people at Apple that are helping us maintain the stability. Uh, as we just spoke about, you know, the ABI stability is a bit of a bummer, but that's something we're going to work through. And additionally, we reached version 1.0 in September 2016, which, not coincidentally, is when Swift version 3 became live. Uh, we decided to go with that simply because of the interface stability, so we went with that. And on Bluemix, which is our hosting provider, you, there's actually a runtime where you can go to a website and write Swift in that website, and it will compile for you, and you can play around with Swift. So this reduced a barrier to entry, and this was important for the sake of giving people an option. Now, we've talked a little bit about how there's opportunities to write REST APIs and Node, PHP, et cetera, all the languages, but showing people the power of Swift and how nice of a language it is to write in, and then giving people a tool so that they could learn how to do it easier, is very important, and I, I want to dive a little bit deeper into at least my personal story, just so that I can make sure I've given you the effect of why this was important to me. So like I said, it came out in February 2016, and it's actually been just over a year since this came out. And I remember I found out about it because I follow a bunch of bots on Twitter that tweet out these new frameworks that people are working on, and I happened on this. And personally, when I didn't have any association with IBM at the time, I had no idea that anything like this would have come out. And I was surprised, as you can tell by the content of my tweet. And uh, one person liked and retweeted it. He works for IBM, Jim Avery. And in February 2016, when I learned about it, I played around with it. Holy crap, I can write a web server now. That's very powerful to me. But then I kind of went about my business. Um, a month later, my credit card got charged for $1,600 in the middle of the night. And I found out I was going to go to San Francisco. And I was standing in line. And I was talking to this poor guy. Uh, who said he had contracted for IBM, and I said, oh my god, have you heard of Kitora? It's this cool framework, and I'm, I'm talking this guy's ear off, and he says, I, I have no idea what you're talking about. But I'm talking his ear off, and um, as luck would have it, I happened to be standing in front of Pat Borer, and Pat Borer is the lead distinguished engineer on the Kitora project. He tapped me on the shoulder and started talking to me. The rest is history, and that's why I'm here. And uh, I have told some people that story, and they don't believe me. Uh, this is a picture from the Developer Works blog of IBM, and that's Pat Bohr and John Ponzo standing in that picture. They took that picture standing in line at WWDC, and whenever somebody says, I don't believe you, how can you tell me you were really there? Well, <laughs> so yeah, I was there too. Now, 
importantly, when we talk about how much Keturah has matured since then, we take a look at what happens now. So we're past the point of going past version 1.0. We're actually already, we've already released version 1.5.1. And we still maintain stability alongside Swift 3. We've got support for most major data stores, so you've got support for MongoDB, MySQL, Microsoft SQL, Postgres, et cetera. And not just us that we're working on these connectors, but we've seen a lot of support in, from the community in getting these connectors up and running. And we've got support for things like WebSockets. You can do protocol buffers with Swift, and you've got a native querying language that we're going to talk about in just a minute, and I'll be showing you some demos of this. What I think is the most amazing thing, though, is Swift is starting to be treated as a first-class language. And it's interesting to me that in the mobile space, it's arguable that there is no greater language to learn than Swift because of how easy it is, how low the barrier to entry is, and just how well it performs. You know, the framework UI kit is among the best in the business. But when you start thinking of first-class language, you have to remember that there are not just mobile developers in the world, there are people that deal with server-side language. And so you start to think of all the other services that have come up to support Swift now. Swift actually released an official Docker image. You can run Swift on an Amazon Web Services server. You can run it, you can run it on API, uh, IBM Bluemix, and API Connect. And we'll also, um, there's also a lot of work being done with gRPC, which is a new protocol that's showing how Swift can run. So what's interesting about this is the amount of choice that developers have. And that's what I'd really like to drive home, is to make sure everybody knows that not only is it popular amongst our particular sect of developers, but now, because it's growing into a first-class language along the likes of JavaScript, along the likes of PHP and Go, you're also talking about giving the developer choice. So that can only mean good things. So let's go ahead and dive into the first of three demos that I'm going to be walking you through. And it's important to point out, by the way, that in these demonstrations, uh, we've stepped past the point of instantiating uh, a version of our Kitura server. So I've already created the basic containers, I've already created the basic servers, and we're gonna be diving into code that's more or less already been written and modifying it and showing you how it works. I will step you through what happens. And uh, a little shout out, by the way, Paul Hudson's been doing a workshop all week. He is actually doing a workshop on server-side Swift this Saturday, and I strongly recommend that you go check it out. He will be using Keturah in his demos. So what is Swift Query? Uh, who here has used Microsoft Link before? Okay, wow, good, good. This is similar to that in the sense that it's a database driver that you can plug in that uses SQL. And it's, there's a focus on making the API easy to use and quote unquote, Swifty. Now it's important that this will not build out an ORM for you, but it is great to help you support one because it will let your developers ha not have to worry about the conundrum of writing raw SQL, although it's important to point out that you can write raw SQL using this framework and it will still work just fine. Why would you? I don't know. Maybe you have a bad case of Stockholm Syndrome, but this gives you the ability to not have to worry about that. The currently supported databases for Swift Query are gonna be Postgres and SQLite. For the sake of this demo, I have Postgres running locally on my machine. It's accessible at port 5432, which if you've used Postgres before is the default port. The reason that they've chosen, at least from what I understand, uh, Postgres and SQLite instead of MongoDB or something that's a bit more popular and flat right now is the ability to focus on joining more tables together, which you can do in Swift Query. Um, if you focus on the ability to do that, the ability to work with one single flat table in MongoDB is more or less trivial. We just have to work on getting the connector together. And for the sake of this demo, I've got a table up here that just shows me a set of grades. It's important to notice that I don't have a primary key here. The ID is not unique. We're just gonna assume that this is a table that shows a bunch of students taking a bunch of courses and we want to identify them. So simple data set. We're gonna walk through what we can output here. So we're gonna dive right into my command line and hopefully that's uh, legible enough. So as we said, I've got two demos that I'll be able to show you locally running on the command line. We'll jump into the query demo. And what I've done here is I've used Swift Package Manager to actually set up my project structure. Uh, I'm happy to talk more offline about that, but that's something that I've already done and I've set up the structure of my project. It's pulled down the necessary packages for me and we're just gonna dive right into the Xcode project that I've actually generated. So Swift Package Manager, it's important to point out, does not by default generate an Xcode project for you. It's a separate command that you can do and we're just gonna go ahead and open that up right now. So. Is that legible for every, sorry, is that legible for everybody or should I make that a little bit bigger? I'll, I'll make it a little bit bigger. There we go. 
that's a little bit better. Okay, so to walk through the structure of what we have, so judging on the table that we saw, what I've done is I've went ahead and I've made a very, very simple class uh, for my grades, and it adheres from the object table. And the only non-parametrized uh, input that I have to give it is the table name, which it will override this particular operator, and then I'll be able to set using the class for a column the different names of the columns that I've got. So again, we have the three columns, ID, course, grade, None of them are a primary key, and this is the only table that we have to concern ourselves with. Below here, and let me just really quickly make sure. Okay, great, yeah, my Postgres container is running. So, I've instantiated that table so I don't have to constantly manually refer back to it here. And I've went ahead and I've created a Postgres SQL connection using the module that I imported here, Swift Query Postgres QL. I've set the host to be localhost, I've set the port. I've got a set of options that I can pass in, which I can expand as much as I want if need be. I've passed in the database name, which is simply Postgres, my username, which is just my system username on my computer, and then a password, which I've left blank for this demo. After we do that, we write a connect function on our connection that we've instantiated, and we get an asynchronous return uh, with an error being passed into our closure. And basically, all we're going to do is print out if there's an error or not. So just for the sake of making sure that I am not uh, stepping on my own toes, I'm gonna to run it, and great. Okay, so we're able to establish our connection. So, next, we've got a function here that is saying, okay, we're gonna execute our select query. So what is this function going to do? So let's go ahead and uncomment this. Now, we're going to add our query here, and I'm gonna type that here in just a second, but just to show you what we're going to be outputting is on that connection, I'm gonna execute a query, and it's important to point out also that if I wanted to, here, let me just mute that connection.execute, and you see here, like I said, if I wanted to execute a raw query, I could just write the string there, but we're going to use an actual query that we're going to construct here. So I'm gonna execute that query, and it again runs an asynchronous function for me. I get that result, and then I can work on that result and look at all the titles of the columns I have. I can look at all the rows. It's basically a way to take the pain in the butt out of working with a database driver. So, we've made a Swifty API, and let's say I just wanna go ahead and I wanna get all of my grades. So for this, all I have to do is type select, and I can do grades.id, grades.course, and grades.grade. And I specify the table that it's from, Now I can run this, and you'll see here on my local machine, it's just gonna print everything out for me. And that's it, that's how simple it is. And a quick side note before we go any further, I'm not running this in a Kitura server because it's trivial to show that this is just working, so we're just running this inside of a main function that we've got here in a Swift runtime, but this is just easy to get up and running from the beginning. So okay, great, I was able to basically do a select star. Awesome. But obviously we wanna take it a little bit further. So we start thinking about, okay, what if I wanted to specify a condition on that? You would think, okay, well, where am I gonna type my where clause? You can daisy chain commands on this. So I can simply, after I do my select star, I can type where, and it will let me filter in all of my conditions that I have. And it's the simplest typing. Let's say I only wanna see grades that are above a 90 because I only care about A students, which is why I'm so happy I have all of you here. So I'm gonna type in grades.grade is greater than, uh, we'll say 89. And if I run that, you'll see that I no longer have any grades underneath that. Simple as that. And then let's say I want to daisy chain even further onto that and I want to order what I've got. I can even do that. So I can simply, let's see, I would type in ascending for that. And I'm gonna say in the order of ascending grades, I want to see grades that are above a 90. And if I run that as well, you can see that it's showing ascending. And let me actually, Instead of showing the ID in the grade course, we're just going to show the grades, and it'll be easier to tell the ascending grades. There you go. So now you can order it, you can uh, add where conditions, you can actually average off. So you're thinking, okay, well, how is a more complex query going to look? Well, we can get a bit more complex. So, and I admit that I had to write this down on my phone just to make sure I have it. So let's say that I wanted to look at all of the courses where I can round the grades as an average around 90, where I can order them in an ascending order, grouping them by the course. How would I do something like that? And actually the answer is quite simple because all I have to do is do select grades.course. And I would type round here, avg grades.grade. 
2, 1 as average. from grades. There we go. And now we want to make sure that we're grouping those by our particular course that we're looking at. So we can do grades.course. And then we want to specify the having. So we want to type average grades.grade that are only, again, greater than 90. And then we specify our order here. And we're going to type in again the ASC for ascending. And then we again do the average to make sure we maintain that, grades.grade. And we're done. And right out the box, thank God that compiled on the first try, and there you go. And there's our output from that. So that's how you can do simple select clauses with that. Obviously, there's the ability to do insert, update, delete, all of those. I'm happy to chat with you more about that after the talk. So that's a quick example of how you can get Swift Query running right in your browser. So as you start to work with persistent data sources, you can get that up and running and fetch from a data store. So let me unmirror my displays again. Very good. Okay, the second demo we're gonna talk about is a WebSocket connection, and a show of hands who has worked with WebSockets before. Great, you'll be happy to know that Kitora does support them now, and we do have a framework that's going to work with them. So for those of you who don't know, a WebSocket basically allows you to asynchronously send and receive data packets through an open connection. You can send either binary data or a string, and the benefit to that is it's unlike a RESTful communication in the sense that it's not request and response. You can send as many data packets as you want, and you can wait until the person who's picking up those calls is getting something back, and you can actually do something with those once they come back. Uh, this is a protocol called RFC 6455, which you can look up online, and just like you would expect it to be HTTP colon slash slash, it's simply going to be ws colon slash slash. All you need for this particular demo is a website that we're going to use called websocket.org, and it's just echo. And all we're really going to do is going to set up a connection that echoes out a message that we send back to it. And we don't need to have Postgres set up for this, and we will be running this in Kitora. So, okay. So we've done query, let's back out of that, and let's go into our WebSocket demo. Same thing here, I have set up my packages, and I just wanna give you a quick look at what that package folder, uh, package file looks like here. So this is what a manifest looks like in the Swift Package Manager. Uh, if you use something like NPM, this is gonna look familiar to you. You can specify major version, minor version, and it's gonna list it like that. And interesting to note, this file is actually written in Swift. So the Swift Package Manager will actually consume those kinds of files. You can see here that it's just gonna specify our Git repos that we have. For this, we're using Kitura, Helium Logger, and the WebSocket library that we've already written. So diving right into that. We can see here that we've got, we're just gonna open up our echo server that we've got. All right. Now, this is gonna look a little bit more like Kitora. So what we've done here is we've imported all of the necessary libraries we've got. We're using our logger, and you create a router, which is gonna be just like Express and probably what you've seen if you've ever worked with Express before. Then what you're going to do is you're gonna simply register your WebSocket. We're gonna name a service that we've created a separate class for just so that we can have a nice organized project, and we can specify the path here. So we're just gonna specify Kitora Echo. This is where you could have certain logic to generate up a service, so there's lots of examples out there, but we're just gonna generate this path. This is just a bunch of Swift magic to determine the port. Uh, inevitably, it will resolve to port 8090, which is what default is for Kitura. And then down here, you add your HTTP server, specifying a port with your router. Router, sorry. I've only been back in the USA for four months. And then you run your service on the main loop. So it's important to point out, and this is uh, really, really important to point out when I say that, is this is going to run on your quote unquote main queue, which is a serial queue. So if you try dispatch queue main, Anytime you're running in a Keturah instance, nothing will happen because this run loop is taking over that and running constantly. So you have to make sure you do a good job of managing your queues as you go through. And this is where you have to be careful about, oh, let me just use the global queue. Well, you have to make sure that you're using the right one. And that's where it's good practice in libdispatch to actually set up your own queues and manage those correctly. So what does this echo service look like? Once we've specified it, it's gonna adhere to this protocol, which you can go to the documentation for it and it will give you all of the parameters, but we're just gonna look at the functions. So we've got a function for connected, which basically just says, great, we've registered a connection. Do whatever you want on your server, whatever you have to pull from your data store. 
Uh, maybe when you get disconnected, you want to get that reason sent out and you want to be able to handle that appropriately. And then these are your functions for receiving data, whether it's going to be of data or string. This is a good opportunity to show off function overloading as well with different data types. So we've got both data and a string. And if I just run this, so it will run this here for me. And it will say, okay, great, listening on port 8090, and it's running, and that's great, but it doesn't really do anything. And even if I go to this page where I'm going to, let me make that a little bit bigger. Okay, so when we talk about opening up that WebSocket connection, if I try to open that up, it will say connected. I didn't mean to send that just yet. But if I send it off, nothing will happen. So, okay, what are we going to do in that particular scenario? So we're going to go back to our Katura service, and we're going to take care about our received function. So this is where we say, okay, we're going to get in a string, and we want to look into that. So we're going to create a local variable. We'll just call it var message counter equals zero. And then whenever we get a message, let's just say we want to increment that by one. So we'll say message counter plus equal one, and then we want to log to our debugger, got message, don't know why it's not auto-completing on me, but that's okay, okay, so we're logging that, and then it's as simple as once you've got that connection, all you have to do is say from, send a message, and we're just going to say, the echo that we've got back. So we're just going to send it back the message, but we'll actually send back the counter as well. Message counter. And there we go. So what this should do is whenever we're sending over our WebSocket a message that we've got something new, we should be able to get that back along with the number of messages that we've sent. So we're going to build that. It will ask me to allow connections. I'm going to go ahead and reconnect. And if I say something like, hello, great. Ah, I didn't, I typed in actual message. I probably need to type the actual there. Let's run that one more time. Reconnect once more, and there we go. So we can type something like, hello, forward Swift. And over that asynchronous connection, we're gonna get the number of messages that we've got. Simple as that. Thank you, one person, one cloud, thank you. So, <laughs> so that's all well and good, and there's so much more to go over when it comes to Katura, and like I said, Paul's doing a great workshop on that. I'm happy to spend some time talking with you about that as well. But let's talk a little bit about what else is there to do with server-side Swift. So, you're probably thinking, what is that mystery demo that he had up? What is he gonna show me next? Well. All this time I've spent talking about server-side Swift, and I forgot to mention that you can actually do serverless Swift. Exactly, what? So, it uses Apache OpenWhisk, which just so happens to be deployed on, and let me put on my marketing hat a little bit. There we go, it runs on IBM Bluemix. So, what you're gonna need to do in order to see what this is, and by the way, when we say serverless, we mean that the opportunity to write an actual API that receives a request and sends back a response you don't have to worry about that anymore because it will take care of this for you. And instead of worrying about routers and methods, you only have to start worrying about actions. So in order to do this, for the sake of this demo, you can open up an account on Bluemix, which I'll post these slides online on Speaker Deck so that you can get all of these links afterwards. And we're just gonna dive right in as well. Okay, so when you log on to Bluemix and you create your account and you go to Open Whisk, you're greeted with an, a screen which allows you to pick amongst your actions that you've got. And it's still loading here, but at least we've got the page open. We're gonna try refreshing that once more. There's an old saying that if you want to make God laugh, try to do a plan of a deployed serverless Swift demo using Blue Mix. I think that's how the saying goes. I could be wrong. Well, in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and skip this. I'm very sorry, uh, but I'm happy to show this demo to you after this talk so I can get this running and we'll make sure we show you how this works. So why don't we just go ahead and dive right back into this. 
but it's important to point out just so I can kind of uh, verbally describe what we've made here. Uh, so what I did was I created a simple function that you can actually write the code for right in the web. And all it does is it takes in a parameter of a guess, it detects the amount of digits in it, and it generates a random number with the same amount of digits, and then checks to see if the random number that it generated is the same, and it will return you a payload of your original guess, what the number was that was generated, and if the numbers match. It sounds simple, but the ability to only have to write Swift and to get a fully RESTful API up and running is simple. And as I do that, I just remembered that I actually have Postman up and running, so I can actually show you the result of it. And so we can look here a little bit at this particular uh, parameter. So we can see here, this is the URL that I've specified. And I want to get, not that, just a moment. There we go. So that's the URL that I have that it generated for me with OpenWhisk. The header that I'm going to send is simply my basic authorization along with the token. I'm sending content type application JSON. And the body I'm going to send is just guess is nine. And we're going to send that off and hope like hell that it comes back to us. Beautiful. And everything that comes back, and so this is what I mean about not having to worry about setting up and rolling up a RESTful API with all the worries about authentication and everything. If you can let a tool do all that work for you, great, in the words of my friend Ray Camden. And you can see here that the response we gave it, so in the body I said guess nine. Sure enough, it gave me back that guess nine, but unfortunately, I was wrong. And the answer is two, and so it says correct uh, false. So you can see all the other information that this gives me, and I've had to do nothing other than sign up for an account on Bluemix and write the Swift logic that this function is going to take in. So to finish off a little bit, A little bit of a recap is Swift is maturing super fast, and I think it's really important to consider that Swift is being treated as a first-class language now. Uh, and with Kitora, we're focused on long-term support so that you can use your existing knowledge that you have of Swift and take that to a different domain altogether. You don't have to worry about learning too many new things. Uh, I will post these two demos on GitHub, so that's my URL for that. I recommend checking out Kitora.io. Uh, if you want to try some tutorials with Kitora, or again, you can make sure that you go to Paul Hudson's workshop all week long. And on Saturday, he's going to be talking about server-side Swift. And while I'm here, I have t-shirts. I have, I know we gave out all our beanies. We have stickers. We even have a JavaScript developer here to talk about how Swift has influenced his career. So if you have any other questions, please come up. But you can follow me on Twitter at doken24, and I'll be here all day. Thank you very much.